so good to have you guys. If you guys want to follow along as we continue our Lost and Found series, we have paper notes on the tables around you. You can also download our Father's House app and follow along on our digital notes. But uh, hey, we're here for moms. We're here to celebrate them and the unique gifts that God has given them. For instance, they can interpret something like this. Look at this. I, I don't even know what these symbols mean on this. Uh, what, what even is that? I don't know. But if you have a hard time understanding what that is, they're guaranteed there's a mom around you that knows how to interpret that. Moms are amazing. They're incredibly strategic. Like when your baby, like we just so I just got to meet the lips, um, Ben and Kendall's little baby, Judith. Oh my goodness, what a cutie. And they were just talking about how careful they have to be when he's finally asleep to move him back to the crib. It's like diffusing a bomb, right? If you jostle anything, if anything moves out of order, it's like the, if he comes awake and it's all, you're, you're done, you're done. But moms are incredibly patient. Like when, when a kid is like telling a story and they're like, and, 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 and then, and, and, and then, and the moms are standing there listening, just begging, pleading for something to come out and move that story along. Moms, you put up with you put up with those unending stories that make absolutely no sense. Or giving, like when your kid is in your bed and somehow, even though they're half the size, they take up the entire bed. You know, just like Rose. There was room, Rose. There, there was room. Uh, or when you're so understanding, moms, you're just incredibly understanding. Like when your you know, kids draw a picture of you. And instead of all the amazing things that you do, they just happen to draw a picture of maybe when you lost your temper. And, and of course, that's what they draw a picture of and they show their Sunday school teacher. Um, multitasking, right? You guys are absolutely amazing. I don't know how you guys do so many things all at once, and yet there's still people who have the gall to say, so what do you do all day, right? Ask me that one more time. I dare you. I dare you. So uh, and, you know, you're so appreciative. Like, you know, when we, uh, you finally get to leave the house and there's no kids. Like, my wife would just, like, wander through the aisles of Target. Just, like, not to buy anything necessarily. Just because there was nothing hanging on her shoulders and no one screaming or running for the toy section. And I, I know only God is omniscient. But I promise you that I, have, I, I think Cindy has some level of omniscience because it doesn't matter where she is. She always knows where everything is in the house all the time. My, my kids don't even bother coming to me anymore. And when they do, I just say, well, where's your mom? Because I really, I really don't know. It doesn't matter what you're asking. Well, I'm hungry. Where's, uh, where's my shirt? If Cindy can be at work, and one of my boys can say, "Hey, mom, where's that black eagle shirt that I wore last summer with the rip in the corner?" And she'll be like, "Well, it's actually in the green dresser under the yellow shirt with the pocket on it." And and they'll go there, and it's like exactly there. And it's just mind blowing how you moms are able to contain all of these details in your brain. I'm, I'm truly, truly amazed, and that's that's why it's a perfect example to talk, continue to talk about our lost and found series, because when anything's lost, my boys don't even come to me anymore. They just go directly to mom, because they cut their time in half trying to find whatever it is that's lost, very much like Jesus, who has a heart for the lost, and he helps us find that which is lost. And uh, again, Luke 15, to just set the set the table here for what we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks. Luke 15, 1 through 3 says, The tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. And this made the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. So Jesus told them the story. And we've been kind of breaking down those stories uh, the first story we looked at was the lost sheep, and that was the, the sheep that wandered away, representing uh, many of us who have wandered away from the faith, and our shepherd who relentlessly went after us to find us. Today we're going to be talking about the lost coin, which is unique in the three parables, because the third one, the lost son, willfully rebelled. That's why he was lost. But this coin didn't do anything on its own. The, the coin, it was kind of a victim of circumstance, if you will. And though we're not, not encouraging victimhood here, the truth is that unlike the sheep and unlike the son, the coin dropped off a necklace and was lost in the house through no fault of its own. And some of us have had things happen to us that were not our choice, not a point of rebellion or wandering, but simply because of the harsh world in which we live. 
And to that end, I want to just spend a couple of minutes here looking at what, you, what Jesus was trying to show us, what he was actually trying to shine a light on, just like all of our amazing moms always keep the light on. I think that's the first thing I want us to look at in this parable, is that you and I are called to keep the light on for the lost. We're called to answer this very specific question. Two questions today. The first one is, can you see me? That's the first point. Can you see me? Everyone actually needs that question answered in their life. And moms are amazing at answering that question. When I felt invisible at school, when I felt invisible at sports, when I felt invisible to girls, my mom always made sure I knew that I was visible, that I was seen, that I, was ma that I mattered, that I was loved. Nightlight, porch light, Flashlight, when I lose something, most importantly, my mom always kept the faith light on to make sure that I knew how to find my way back to Jesus. Look at this parable in Luke 15, verse 8. Jesus says to the crowds, remember it's a split crowd, half of them are religious leaders that think they have it all together, the other half know they're lost, so they're cluing in on this lost coin. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it? This is unique because the other two parables in the lost and found uh, stories, they're all, they're all talking about men. But now he's having a woman be the hero in the savior position of these stories. This was unheard of. You don't have a, don't have a woman be the hero in your story in those days. Women were seen as less than as second class. In fact, the religious leaders that were in that that area, hearing Jesus' story, they would pray every single day, I thank God I was not born a woman. That's how they felt, right? And and yet Jesus is now, he's flipping the table, and he know he knows they're all he's ruffling some feathers in that religious crowd because he's now put the woman at the center of the story. And it's so interesting because he uses this as a chance to shine a light on the oppressed, on the forgotten, on those that have been invisible, and to say, I see you. Mm. Losing a coin in a, in a Palestinian peasant home would not be a difficult thing to do. Most of them were a hard-packed ground covered with palm fronds or some kind of uh, branches. And so when, if you lost a coin, that would be like literally losing a needle and a haystack. Okay, it would be super hard to find. And, and if you're wondering why there's such an urgency for her to find this coin, think about it. The shepherd only lost one sheep out of 99. That's a 1% loss. She's lost one coin out of 10. That's a 10% loss. And these coins, according to scripture, were a day's wages. What makes it even more interesting is that historically, because Jesus doesn't min mention a man in the home, more than likely she is a single woman. And in those days, if you were not married as a woman, you were virtually unseen. And the only thing that could help you be seen is if you had a dowry. And very often in those weddings, you would see a woman crowned with ten coins around her head that she had worked and scraped to save so that she could be seen as worthy and valuable. So every single woman in that crowd, every woman in that crowd that Jesus is talking to, they would have all clued in on the danger, the horror of this woman losing one of her ten coins. Because now what value would she have? Who would possibly marry her? And he's using all of this to speak to the value and the worth of a woman apart from what it is that she owns, apart from who it is that she's married to. And in the same way in this parable where this woman is looking for a lost coin, God, of course, is looking for those who feel unseen, those who feel worth less or value less. And God is saying, your value and your worth doesn't come from who you're married to, or your situation, your status, or your gender. It comes from the one who made you. Only the one who made you gets to define you. Only the one who knit you in your mother's womb gets to tell you who you are. Don't let the world do it. Don't let your culture do it. I love this picture of my mom here holding me as I subtly try to crush my younger brother, Dan. It was... Uh, I, I was the one who ruled the roost until two years later my parents made the mistake of having another child. Yeah. I couldn't believe that they had done this to me. And, and my parents will tell you, because I was the first child, that I really did run the house. Like, 
they didn't have it down, and I had a super strong will, and basically I was getting what I wanted until Dan arrives. Like, what in the world is this? Totally messed up my racket. Now they're all paying attention to him, and they're also realizing that I'm not necessarily supposed to be in charge of the house. So they start saying things like, no, John, you can't do that. I'm going to hug my brother, right? But, I, but my mom, she was so amazing, and I love her uh, to this day. She continues to teach me about how to use my strength not to crush, but to help. Not to hurt, but to heal. When I was a little bit older, she told me this story of uh, her in a grocery parking lot. And there was a gang of women who uh, saw her because of the color of her skin. They all attacked her in the uh, grocery parking lot and just began beating and kicking, punching. And she remembers they're uh, curled up in a ball, screaming for help. And as people were coming out of the grocery store, they were just looking or walking by or looking the other way. And she said, John, don't ever look the other way. God has given you strength not to look the other way, but to step in and help the helpless, to be a voice for the voiceless. Use what it is that God's given you to help those who can't help themselves. And I never, ever forgot that. We live in a culture that will video right. somebody so they can get likes and they can get followers. They'll video somebody without actually helping them. Or they'll be a part of the age of rage, be the ones kicking them when they're down. And you and I have an opportunity to shine a light, just like Jesus was doing through this parable, to answer the question to every single person we come across. Can, when they're asking, can you see me? Do I matter? And that through our, not just our words, but our actions, we would say, absolutely, I see you. More importantly, the one who made you, sees you, and knows your value. And wants to remind you of that today. I just want to, really quick, look at a couple of examples of where Jesus would shine his light. The, the woman in the parable had to had to get a lantern because there there was maybe a, a, a really small window in those clay houses. And in order for her to see and find that coin in among all of the palm fronds all over her floor, she would have had to, to light a lamp and look really, really carefully and to be able to to keep that light on until she turned the whole place upside down, sweeping and cleaning and getting moving everything around until she was able to find it. And this is what our Savior does for us. He shines a light on those that feel like they are lost, like they have no value. We know, of course, that that lost coin had just as much value as the other nine that she still had on her necklace. We know that. But a lot of people don't know that, that they have value and worth because they feel unseen. They don't know that our Savior is actually searching for them. And the only way that they will is if you and I let them know. Right. Through our actions and our words, we speak to them. I just want to shine a light on a couple countercultural things that Jesus was shining a light on. For instance, we know Jesus chose 12 male disciples. But do you know that he actually had a number of female disciples? Not only is he telling a parable about a woman in a heroic uh, part of this story, but he actually had female disciples. Luke 8 uh, 1 through 3 and verse 10 actually names a number of female disciples. And that meant that they were traveling from town to town. And in those days, if you were a, a woman, you had to stay with family. And I guarantee you, they didn't have family in every single town that Jesus and the disciples went to. Not only that, Luke not only points that, he's not hiding the fact, he actually points out that the women were the one funding the ministry. They were using their wealth and resource and status from their communities to actually fund the ministry. Luke isn't hiding this. He's not putting it in a footnote. He's actually making it a part of the description that would have been unheard of for a rabbi, a traveling minister in those days. Because to Jesus, a woman is just as much of a disciple as a man. He's not changing the uniqueness of a woman. What a woman can do that's different from a man. But he is defining and saying, hey, my kingdom includes both Adam and Eve. My kingdom is both men and women. Amen. Different functions. Equal value. Amen. Different functions. Equal value. Isn't it interesting that we now live in a county that has tried to change the definition of a woman? 
And here on Mother's Day, I get to remind you, the only one that gets to define you is the one who made you. Not our culture. Not whatever it's going to say in whatever digital dictionary they're going to come up with next. But Jesus looks at you, every woman in here, He says, there's something beautiful about you that a man will never have. One of those things primarily being that you can give birth. You can bring life from your body. This is amazing. No matter what our Apple iPhone emojis have, no matter what kind of pregnant man icons they put on, no matter what Netflix shows they may show, the enemy is always trying to pervert the unique and beautiful thing that God makes. He hates the fact that unlike him, women can actually bring about life in the same way that God does. He hates that. And so he's going to try and do that even to the point of convincing women that this is more of a detriment than a gift. And this is not to say that you only have value or worth if you've had children. That's not what I'm saying. But you do have something that a man can never do, no matter what our culture tries to tell us. Which is why, interestingly enough, in those days you thought women were looked down on children even more so. And yet Jesus, again, he, they were trying to shoot the kids away and he's bringing them up, up on his lap. He's, he's holding them and he's saying, unless our, we become like one of these kids, not only is he celebrating the faith of a child, he's also celebrating the women who brought that child into this world. Again, Jesus shining a light on the things that are world while our wall. Our world is trying to confuse our kids like never before. Telling them that the way they're born isn't uh, is probably an accident. Our God needs a group of people who can actually say what is true and what is not. Amen. That you and I would actually not be afraid to shine a light. I'm not trying to get political here. I'm just trying to get practical. And when we take away from the beauty of a, of a girl and how God has made her unique, or the beauty of a boy and how God has made him unique, we're just playing right into the enemy's hands. Those whole goals have been pervert God's creation since the first man and since the first woman. And you and I have the opportunity to either hide the light or shine the light. Again, I'm not telling you to get political. I'm just telling you to shine the light. Stand up for what you know the word says is true. Think about the bleeding woman. In those days, a rabbi could not go near, they weren't actually even supposed to go near women, but in the Jewish tradition, a bleeding woman would have been considered unclean. And she had been taken advantage of by one doctor after another. She had no money. Therefore, she had no value. And now she was called unclean. And she's so desperate for healing that she reaches out to touch the hem of Jesus' garment. And Jesus doesn't say, get away from me, woman. Unclean, unclean. No, Jesus actually takes the light, stops the procession, silences the crowd, and says, who touched me? And not to expose her or to shame her, but to hold her up and say, you are seen. I see you. You are a daughter of the Most High. Be healed. What if we did the same thing? What if instead of being driven by the crowd that's driving us towards insanity, the things that are being said today I wouldn't have even thought of even three years ago. What if you and I do like Jesus did? We stop the crowd, we stop the noise, we turn the, all the media feeds off, and we just start looking around us and say, who needs to be seen? Who needs to be reminded they are a daughter of God and they are a son of God? Right. Maybe that's why I'm in their life. Right, right. So instead of like those, everyone else walking by my mom while she's being beaten up, that you and I would actually stand up right. and speak the truth in love towards those in our lives, those are around us. The demon-possessed man that everyone put in the cemetery and considered as dead, he actually didn't avoid him. He went to him and set him free. And then he said, now you go back to your home. And where I shine the light on you, I'm going to have you do that for others. He spoke with a Samaritan woman who was considered a half-breed. The Jews did not associate with, with Samaritans, let alone uh, Jewish rabbis with Samaritan women who were living a loose life. And yet he met her right where she was at, and she turned into an evangelist and led her entire town to the Lord. Unseen, now seen. He spoke with the lepers. Lepers were unclean. They were cast out of the city, told to live outside, and Jesus didn't avoid them. He went to them. Over and over and over again, Jesus looking for the hidden, the broken, 
those that have been dropped, neglected, those that the enemy has said, There's, you have no value, you no worth, and Jesus walks up to him and says, no, 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 I see you. And you are made in the image of God. 1 Peter 1, 9 through 10 says it this way, but you are not like that, for you're chosen people. He's speaking to men and women, young and old, all different cultures. He's speaking to believers. You are a royal priest. Don't for a minute think it's only a guy like me on a stage like this that has a voice and a light. It's you. You're a royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of the darkness, just like that woman in the parable finding that coin. He called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And once you had no identity as a people, and now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. Isn't that beautiful? We've received his mercy, you guys. He has found us out of the darkness and called us into his marvelous life. Not so we can keep it to ourselves, but so that we can go and do that for others. Others that need mercy. We can show it to the others that need to see the goodness of God. Right now, in a land that's trying to erase God. You and I are going to be the ones that can show what it looks like. So, for your community building discussion question, maybe with your, your mom around your lunch or dinner table today, where can we include the excluded? Where can we be a voice to the voiceless, speak worth to the worthless, and see the message in the mess? Because everybody's asking, young and old. One question, can you see me? I have a whole generation saying, can you see me? Right. <laughs> Kim Henson's um, granddaughter Mimi came up to me last week with, with a prayer request. I think, we, I think we have it here. Yeah, it says, uh, and she was serious. She said, I'm, I'm praying that I won't be sad anymore that Tyreek Hill went to the Dolphins and traded off the Chiefs. <laughs> Pastor John will pray for it. She's like, no, 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 no. No, I, I need him to pray for it now. So like, the, she brings it. She's like hiding off over here. And Kim's like, it's, you know, feeling a little sheepish. Like, she really wants to make sure you, she sees you seen this, this prayer request. And, and, and I pray for her. Her heart's broken in this trade. But what I love about that even more is that she, I got to answer that question for you. I see you. Yes. More than that, that she knows she can come to God about anything. Right. Not just the churchy things. Right. She can come to God about anything. Doesn't this next generation know God sees them? That God loves them? That God hears them? Not just in church, but any time, no matter how trivial we may think it is. My goodness, I'm glad that she knows. God cares about what makes your heart sad. I like this next meme right here. My good mother, Susan. Um, this next meme. Here, got that? Yeah. My name is Amy. <laughs> I'll admit, when the twins were young, I couldn't really tell them apart. Uh, thing one, thing two, I mean, I just, I figured... If they were getting fed, clothed, and, and, I mean, that's good enough, right? At least for now. I know which one of you guys, I know which was which now, but Cindy, she was much better than names. She was much better than names. All right, so keep the light on. Answer that first question. The second question, moms are really good at answering. Jesus is answering is, do I belong here? Keep the light on. Keep the door open. Keep the light on, keep the door open. Can you see me? Do I belong here? Jesus continues in the parable, Luke 15, 8 through 10. When, 9 through 10, when she finds it, she will call in her friends and neighbors and say, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost coin. And in the same way, there's joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. Now, we know that, of course, in the parable, the coin couldn't repent, it's an inanimate object. But Jesus immediately brings it to you and I, saying that even if 
things have happened to us. And as a result of that, we have spiraled out of control. We have fallen into a life of sin. We have rebelled and we have run. The doors of heaven are open for those who repent. God, that's never going to slam the door in the face of anyone who repents. He always keeps the door open. He is saying to everybody in that crowd, specifically the religious leaders, they thought it didn't apply to them. But he knew those the notorious sinners, the ones who had had one thing after another happen to their life. And he's saying to them, the door of heaven is open. You're not just going to be quietly ushered in. No, no, all of heaven's going to stop. Hold up the light and go, oh my goodness, look who's here. They just repented. They just, they just changed the way they thought. They just saw themselves as how God had made them. And all of heaven is going to throw a party. Just one sinner repents. Can you imagine how much felt? To the crowd that was listening to Christ that felt constantly condemned by their religious leaders. And now here is this guy, this rabbi, who's not only talking about the value and worth of women, but is now saying that there's room for me in heaven? This is an amazing, redemptive story. And moms are so good at communicating this to our wayward children. Over and over again, from even youngest of age, you always keep the door open. Unless they're trying to open it while you're driving, like uh, like in this this picture here, Aww. or you're always so keeping the door open even when they find permanent markers Aww. and take a long time to get off the face. You are you are amazing at how even you keep the door open even when they press the button to turn the blender on when there's no lid on it. Aww. Can we just hear for our moms today? Come on, you guys. Wow. You know, I apologize to Justice and Jackson because I we were taking more pictures when we had them. I sorry guys, you're you're in my uh, my illustrations here. But again, ever ask yourself why why are children eight hundred percent worse around their moms? I, I mean, have you guys ever have you guys ever asked yourself that? Like you you they come home from a play date and the parents are like, uh, they, they, you're so you're so great manners, so. So kind with their words. We love having your children over. And you're kind of looking at them like, you're talking about my kids, right? My kids? You're saying that, oh, they're amazing. What did you do? And you just go, well, you know, it's just, it's natural. It's natural. I mean, if you're a good parent, it just kind of happens that way. You're right, you try to play it off, but in the back of your mind, you're like, I have no idea why is that and then the moment that you close the door it's like <gasps> like an atom bomb goes off and all the, all of the wonderful behavior that you heard about at school or at their friend's house i don't know what happened to that child but they must have left that child at that house and now this child the one that is just has a mood about everything and has to cry about everything and, and has to argue about everything that's the child that you have and i, I heard someone present it this way the reason why they are the worst around you, it's because they're the safest around you. And that while they're at school, and while they're at sports, and while they're at friends, they put on their best behavior. And they're holding all those emotions in when they felt rejected. When they didn't make that play. When they got a bad grade on, on their report card. When they weren't allowed to sit at that lunch table. When the one they thought that was their best, best friend chose somebody else. And then hold all those emotions in until they get to a safe place. And you open that door and you bring them in. And they are the worst of the worst. But here's what they know. You love them just as messy as they are. You love them right where they are. Amen. And to that, I say you are an amazing reflection of our Savior. And then I think that's where we get on in church. I think I'll come to church when I get it together. Sometimes I can call up people like, I haven't seen you for a while. What's going on? i got some awful stuff going on in my life. I'm working it out, and then I'll be there. And I'm like, no, 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 you, you got it wrong. Church isn't for when you get it all together. Church is for when it's all falling apart. Church is to help you bring it together. And that's why we come together. Church isn't for those who think they are healthy. And like half of this crowd that was listening to Jesus. Church is for those who know they're sick. You guys... As your pastor, feel the freedom to come here messy. Feel the freedom to not have it together. Feel the freedom to come when your life is falling apart. 
Why would I do that? Because there's healing in the house of God. And we always keep the door open. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've come from, you belong. And here at the Father's house, you can belong even before you believe. If you're here and you don't even have faith in Jesus, I'm so glad you're here. And we want to be here for you. 1 Peter 1, 11 through 12 says it this way, Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. I'm including this part of the verse because... Uh, because of the crazy stuff that's going on in our culture right now, it's going to be super, super easy for us to start slamming doors in people's faces that are saying the most ridiculous things. Mm -hmm. And yet those are the people that Jesus also died for. Yeah. And you and I have to make sure that we are honorable in our words and our deeds. Right. We have to make sure that we aren't slamming the door in people's faces, no matter how vicious, no matter how off the wall, no matter how opposite of the scriptural truth that you and I are guided by. We must know we're in their lives to keep the light on and the door open. Maybe it starts with your family. Maybe it even starts with one of your kids or if you're a mom in here or maybe it starts with your mom if you're a kid in here and you guys haven't talked for a while. We're called to a ministry of reconciliation. This is how we keep the door open. This is how we let those in our lives know that they belong. It doesn't mean we agree. I'm not telling you you have to agree. But you do need to let them know that they belong. So where have you slammed the door that needs to be reopened? How do I reopen that door? Start with the three hardest things to say. I was wrong. I need help. I wish you some sauce. <laughs> the only reason I know how to say that is because my dad was a chef. And he taught me how to say that. But if you look at that word, that's super hard. Worcestershire sauce. <laughs> but you know what? Don't even worry about the third one. Let someone else figure that one out. Just focus on the first two, and you'll be able to start opening up the door. 